and ask for member statements. Okay, point of order. The, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Speaker, if you seek it, you will find unanimous consent to allow all members to wear pins in recognition of April being Canadian Cancer Society's daffodil campaign. Member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to allow members to wear pins in recognition of April being the cancer, Canadian Cancer Society's daffodil campaign. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Member statements. The member for Markham Unionville. Join Premier Ford's funding announcement of nine million for the establishment of York University School of Medicine. This new medical school will be the first in Canada to focus on training family doctors that will work together towards ensuring Ontarians have access to connected and convenient care they deserve. It stands as a significant milestone, underscoring our government's steadfast commitment to improving health care accessibility and quality across our communities. I firmly believe that nurturing a new generation of primary care physicians will not only serve to strengthen our communities, but also contribute sustainably to the overall health and well-being of Ontarians. I would like to commend the university for its unwavering dedication to addressing the health care needs of underserved regions. Furthermore, I am enthusiastic about the forthcoming opening of York University's Markham campus this spring. This, strategy, this strategic move will embed the university in the vibrant heart of Markham Unionville one of the most diverse and dynamic urban communities in our province and country. As MPP for Markham Unionville, I pledge for my, my full support to York University's endeavors in nurturing talents for our province and nation, and I remain committed to advocating for their continued success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. I've spoken many times in this House about Beyond the Streets, a volunteer-run organization in Welland that connects those without a home to community services and basic necessities. This winter, Beyond the Streets created and operated an emergency shelter in partnership with Holy Trinity Church in downtown Welland. They started this shelter after they saw people nearly die of hypothermia on the streets earlier this winter and because other shelters were completely full. Unfortunately, their shelter closed last week due to an end to a city grant that lasted to the end of March. In the words of the organizers, what we can say from all this is that the need is greater than we even ex ever expected. Our friends need a permanent place to go until they can find a place to call home. Living on the streets isn't a life for anyone. It doesn't allow for anyone to better themselves because they are always in survival mode. So we guess the next question is, do we give people a fighting chance? Speaker, access to housing is a human right. No person should be living on the streets, fighting for their survival through the bitterly cold winter months. A fighting chance means housing, food, and medical attention, as well as livable assistance rates. My heartfelt, heartfelt thanks go out to the dedicated volunteers from beyond the streets, Holy Trinity Church, and the citizens of Welland for stepping up and making this emergency shelter happen when other levels of government failed. Thank you, Speaker. Member statements. The member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you very much, Speaker, and good morning. Speaker, I want to share about the legacy of local news reporting in Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Founded in, back in, in the back of a Newburgh, Ontario store in January of 1870 by Cephas Beeman, the Addington Beaver newspaper shared local news on a four-page, six-column weekly paper. Shortly after creating the paper, he then sold it to his brother George Beeman and his partner William Templeton, moving it to Napanee, calling it the Ontario Beaver. And then shortly thereafter, the Napanee Beaver, and had it has remained a family-owned business. 
In 1892, George Beeman sold his portion of the paper to Templeton, who remained the sole owner of that newspaper until his death in 1908, when his wife took over that paper. For several generations, the family ran the paper until 1953, when they sold the paper to a local family, Earl and Jean Morrison. And then after Earl's death in 1978, Jean continued that tradition of the Napanee Beaver. The Morrison family led that paper for more than 30 years. But just recently, the Napanee Beaver has been sold to Adam Prudhomme. Adam has actually been an, a, a resident of Napanee and an employee since 2008 and been the managing editor for, since 2019. Throughout its existence, the Napanee Beaver has won numerous awards both Ontario, from, from both the Ontario and the Canadian newspaper associations. And Speaker, I'm delighted to see the tradition of community-owned local news still alive here in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member Statements. The member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. On Tuesday, June 28, 2022, the jury recommendations from the Renfrew inquest into the deaths of Carol Culleton, Anastasia Kuzik, and Natalie Warmerdam were presented. 86 recommendations for change were made, most of them directed to the provincial government. The very first recommendation from that inquest was for the provincial government to declare intimate partner violence an epidemic. A simple yet incredibly important and impactful step that this Conservative government rejected. The government is terribly wrong to reject or resist this recommendation, and tomorrow they have an opportunity to do the right thing by passing Bill 173, the Intimate Partner Violence Epidemic Act. From Windsor across Essex County to Toronto, from Hamilton to Milton and Oshawa, from Niagara, Lanark to Renfrew, from Ottawa to Sault Ste. Marie and Timmins, from Mississauga to Sudbury, Thunder Bay, from Sarnia, Brantford, London to Brampton, just to name a few, 94 municipalities have declared intimate partner violence an epidemic, yet the Conservatives refuse to. We must call this gender-based violence what it is, an epidemic. The Conservative government claimed intimate partner violence is not an epidemic because that term is reserved for the spread of infectious or communicable disease. That is simply semantic speaker, and not only dictionary definitions, but data proves otherwise. And unfortunately, this epidemic continues to claim lives. We need to use every tool available to make a difference. There is one we have right here at our fingertips, and I call on every member of the legislature, including the Premier, to do the right thing and pass Bill 173 tomorrow. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Hi, good morning, Speaker. This past weekend, I was proud to work alongside a team of 70 volunteers at the Bridge Youth Resource Centre in Leamington to participate in an exciting fundraiser led by my friend who operates The Giving Spoon, a local nonprofit charity. The event featured a wide array of fresh homemade soups donated by local families and organizations to raise funds and awareness for youth programs and access to attainable housing. The weekend showcased an impressive lineup—18 cauldrons each day of unique varieties of soup served by volunteers, myself included, to hundreds of people from our community who lined up to enjoy the fresh soup and fellowship while raising important funds for the Bridge Youth Resource Centre. In my non-scientific observation, I would say that the cream of potato bacon was the most popular. The, youth, the Bridge Youth Resource Centre is an organization supporting youth ages 14 to 24 through collaborative programming with multiple community partners to address education, job support, mental health and addiction, social inclusion and general life skills. The facility also supports youth experiencing homelessness or housing instability and actually partnered with Habitat for Humanity and researchers from U Windsor Department of Civil Engineering and Environmental Engineering to design and build 3D homes, the first printed in Canada. Congratulations to my friends at The Bridge and The Giving Spoon for another great event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. In the past few years, Ottawa has experienced multiple severe storms that have taken out power for multiple days. Every time this happens, people on fixed incomes have to throw out a fridge or a freezer worth of food, food that they can't afford to replace. 
Seniors and people living with disabilities who are, live in multi-story multi apartment or condo buildings are being trapped in their own homes without access to food, water or medical care. Those who need life-saving devices struggle to find power sources. We've been incredibly lucky so far that every one of these storms has been followed by reasonably temperate weather, but it's only a matter of time until we have freezing cold or severe heat while the power is out, putting lives at risk. But thankfully, there is a way to address the risks of power outages while also fighting climate change and making life more affordable. Bill 172, the Affordable Energy Act, would save Ontario residents on their hydro bills by investing in deep retrofits, reducing the amount of electricity needed to power a home. It would also oversee the creation of community energy sources, known as distributed energy, such as solar panels on roofs or over parking lots. These would provide energy credits to the owners of the solar panels while offering a cost-effective source of power to the grid. These community sources of energy would also mean that homes and communities will have a local power supply when the grid is down, keeping the lights and heat on for residents of Ottawa. The Affordable Energy Act will be up for debate on Thursday, and I hope that all MPPs, regardless of party, will vote to support this plan for more affordable, climate-friendly and resilient electricity in Ontario. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. And good morning, Mr. Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise today to highlight Ontario's efforts to address the current housing crisis. In August of last year, our government announced a new three-year, $1.2 billion program that provides significant funding for municipalities who are on track to meet provincial housing targets by 2031. In order to achieve Ontario's goal of building 1.5 million homes by 2031, municipalities have agreed to housing targets to assist in meeting the goal. The Building Faster Fund encourages municipalities to meet these housing targets. Municipalities that reach at least 80 per cent of their annual target receive a share of the $1.2 billion program and for those that exceed their targets, even more funding is granted. My community of Hamilton will receive over $17.5 million for exceeding its 2023 target and for breaking ground on a total of 4,142 new housing units last year. I am pleased to recognize the hard work of the City of Hamilton and other communities around the province that have made housing a priority. Ensuring that every resident has an affordable place to call home is our government's top priority, and I am hopeful that with the support of these provincial funds, there will be even more housing starts in the year ahead. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, everyone. Tonight at sundown, Muslims around the world and across Ontario will be begin celebrating Eid al-Fitr to mark the end of Ramadan. For Ramadan 2024, the moon was sighted on the night of Sunday, March 10th. Since then, Muslims who observe Ramadan have taken part in the holy tradition with sunrise to sunset fasting for the entire month, praying, giving and spending time with family. When the month of fasting is over, though, it's time to celebrate. In my riding of beautiful beaches East York, many will be gathering tomorrow morning for Eid prayers at D'Antonia Park, and I have the honour of joining them for that blessed event. I am always so proud to attend Eid prayers and connect with my constituents as they observe this important and sacred event. D'Antonia Park is nestled in the heart of Crescent Town and Bangla Town. Not only can you find the best Bangladeshi food, probably in all of Canada, there, but it is truly a neighbourhood of warmth and camaraderie, where community members look out for one another and lend a helping hand in times of need. Bangla Town and Crescent Town are a testament to the rich culture heritage that thrives within Beaches East York and the beautiful energy that the Bangladeshi Muslim community brings to Toronto and Canada. To Muslims around the world and in Beaches East York, I wish you peace, hope, amazing meals and time with loved ones this Eid. I look forward to seeing familiar faces tomorrow morning for prayers in D'Antonia Park. Eid Mubarak. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Thornhill. 
Last week, I had the great privilege of standing with the Premier and my York Region Caucus colleagues to announce a brand new medical school just north of Thornhill in the city of Vaughan. This school will be the first medical school to focus on primary care physicians, so important. It will include up to 80 undergraduates, 102 postgraduate seats starting in September 2028, with up to 240 undergraduates and 293 postgraduate seats on an annual basis once operating at full capacity. This project is in partnership with York University, will be situated beside the state-of-the-art Cortellucci Vaughan Hospital and the soon-to-be-built uh, long-term care home. Together, these projects will significantly improve the quality of care our families and seniors have, bringing health care closer to home. Uh, speaker, our government is launching the largest expansion of Ontario's medical education system in more than a decade. Parents, students, grandmothers, grandfathers, boobies, zadies, this is so exciting because our students will now have more opportunities to attend medical school locally, just a few minutes north in the city of Vaughan, a little bit north of Thornhill. And that is such positive news. I want to thank my friend and colleague, the member of King Vaughan, for being a strong champion on this project and a great advocate for the people of Thornhill and Ontario. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Broad. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over a century ago, on the 9th of April, 1917, the Canadian Expeditionary Force embarked on a mission to capture Vimy Ridge. This endeavour mobilized over 170,000 Canadians from coast to coast and all segments of society, engaging them in a battle that spanned four days and would eternally etch itself into the annals of our history. The Vimy Offensive epitomized a, a uniquely Canadian venture, serving as a testament to the dominion of Canada's stature as an integral component of the Allied forces. That day, Canadians demonstrated their mettle, securing our enduring reputation as valiant fighters and steadfast allies. Among those who answered the call were numerous individuals from Victoria and Halliburton counties and my own hometown of Kimmount. They were part of the 109th Battalion. My grandfather, Wallace Scott, stood among those brave souls. He was one of the gallant Canadians who charged at Vimy on April the 9th, sustaining serious injuries. Despite his wounds, like many of his fellow servicemen, he healed and rejoined the battlefront, remaining until the war's conclusion. The Battle of Vimy emerged as a pivotal chapter in our nation's story, ignited a newfound sense of national pride, and today we collectively honour the memory and sacrifice of those who fought at Vimy Ridge and in subsequent conflicts. Commemorating a significant milestone in our nation's journey, we will remember them lest we forget. Thank you very much. That concludes our member's statements for this morning. I understand